next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Anna Chrysostomo from uh, the University of, uh, of jo Johannesburg. Welcome, uh, Anna. Thank you for being with us today. And, uh, <clears throat> and she will speak about uh, on the computation of black holes, uh, black hole quasi normal modes. Yeah. And uh, Anna, thank you for, for being here. You are welcome to start sharing uh, your screen and, uh, and, and start your, your, your presentation. And uh, please, participants, since Anna is with us, uh, don't be shy in, uh, in posing questions uh, in, the, in the facility at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Please, you can uh, you can uh, you can start. Great, thank you so much. Um, just to check, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you very much. Great, great, perfect. Okay, so hi, um, my name is Anna Hisostomo. Thank you so much for having me here today. It is a pleasure to be among you all, if only virtually. Um, so I've been looking into the uh, black hole quasi normal modes under the supervision of Prof. Alan Cornell. So what we're looking at in particular is the quasi-normal modes of higher dimensional spherically symmetric black holes with a special focus on their behavior in asymptotic limits and with a pronounced focus on half integer perturbations. So we'll begin this presentation with a description of quasi-normal modes and how they arise in the context of a black hole. And then we'll look at the technicalities, uh, namely um, looking at the quasi-normal mode as an eigenvalue problem and extracting a black hole wave equation to describe its radial behavior. Thereafter, we'll look at some of the asymptotic work that we've done over the past year. So let's begin with that first question. What is a quasi-normal mode? In its simplest terms, you can think of the quasi-normal mode as the more realistic counterpart of the normal mode. The common explanatory example is the perturbed wine glass. So the gentle chime dies with time as energy is lost to the environment. Had this been a normal mode, the ringing would carry on into infinity. But of course, nature is hardly so consistent. For our purposes, we're looking at an object slightly more interesting than the common wine glass, namely black holes. So what we have here is a black hole merger. If you think about the simpler times of 2015, that was the first gravitational wave event detected. What we have here are two compact bodies colliding with such violence that the perturbations in space-time can be detected from even here on Earth. Uh, in the case of the waveforms collected, well, they looked a little like this. Um, these are the twin sites at Hanford and Livingston for LIGO. Here you have the data plotted against the predicted waveform. And then the data points are superimposed over one another here to account for things like noise. What we find is that the correlation between data and theory is almost perfect, which you know is kind of beautiful. But of course, physics is a hydra. You solve one problem and two more take its place. As for me, I'm just a novice in uh, theoretical gravitational physics. So I'm more interested in this not so discernible predictive waveform shown here a little bit more clearly. There are three major points of this waveform that need to be taken into account. So here you have in spiral where the orbital decay begins followed by the plunge where orbital decay ends and the collision occurs. And then finally you have ring down which is the site of the quasi-normal mode. From a more mathematical perspective, we can look at the quasi-normal frequency, which is decomposed into its real and imaginary parts. The real represents the physical oscillations, whereas the imaginary part represents the damping. As for the quasi-normal mode itself, that can be neatly decomposed through a spherical decomposition, where you have your radial, temporal, and angular parts. I imagine you're familiar with things like the spin, the azimuthal number, and the angular number. What might be unfamiliar is n, the overtone number, which labels quasi-normal modes by monotonically increasing value. This, uh, for every L, there exists an infinite number of n's. And these two represent the asymptotic limits of interest for us. 
these are what we shall be investigating. Now for the large N, you can see that that corresponds neatly to a highly damped case. For the large L, it's not quite so clear cut. But of course, then there's the question, what is so special about quasi-normal modes? Why are we interested? Well, it turns out that there are certain theoretical gleanings that can be extracted. In the literature, there are three main points that I'd like to address here. The first, for those more astronomically inclined, is that the quasi-normal frequency is independent of the initial perturbation. In other words, whatever event happened to cause the perturbation does not affect the final outcome. It turns out that those, uh, that the final outcome is actually completely dependent on the characteristic information about the black hole source. So we can extract the uh, black hole mass, angular momentum and charge of a black hole from this quasi-normal frequency, which the Nohitea theorem states that you know, it suffices to describe the black hole perfectly. I won't go into details on the second point, but I bring it up to demonstrate that quasi-normal frequencies can be taken beyond their face value and used to explore more abstract kind of concepts. Thirdly, we have this idea that the black hole wave equation can provide us with some kind of uh, intuition about the quantum mechanical description of a black hole. At the turn of our century, there was a conjecture that the highly damped uh, quasi-normal frequency could be related to the area quantization of a black hole event horizon. Now, this has been proven tenuous since such a, such a link only really worked out in a four-dimensional Schwarzschild space-time, which is the simplest static spherically symmetric case. So we consider it more of a historical motivation than anything else. Then there's that question of the physicality of a highly, of a large angular momentum limit. So there are no systematic reviews on this topic. So what we've seen is that in terms of a mathematical physics context, this large L limit is applied to extract an analytical function from a more complicated expression to which you then apply numerical tools like the WKB method in order to perform some kind of calculation. So let's return to that black hole wave equation. It began with black hole perturbation theory. There was a paper in 1957, which was a stability analysis of the Schwarzschild black hole. So Reggie and Wheeler uh, introduced a first order perturbation, which we now know as a weak field limit, into the uh, Einstein field equations. And they found that the radial behavior for the gravitational mode, the vector mode of the gravitational field specifically, could be expressed in this very neat form. Uh, and that was with the introduction of the so-called uh, so tortoise coordinates. A few years later, it really extended this to include also the scalar mode. So what we found was that the gravitational perturbations in four dimensions at least, for the Schwarzschild black hole could be described completely with the second order ordinary differential equation, which the literature tends to refer to as a Schrodinger type equation for the sole reason that you can apply the same kind of numerical techniques uh, that we ordinarily use to solve the Schrodinger equation to this expression. Further generalizations occurred in subsequent years, culminating in Ishibashi and Kodama's full generalization of gravitational perturbations. Now, when you look to the high dimensional case, you need to include also a tensor mode to fully describe these perturbations. Note also that we have a mu and a lambda. So the mu parameterizes the mass of the black hole, whereas the lambda uh, parameterizes the cosmological constant. We know that for a positive cosmological constant, we have a de Sitter space time and negative refers to anti de Sitter. If it is zero, we have the flat space with which we are familiar. Now, in terms of the half integer perturbations, it turns out that we can similarly generalize things to an extent. Here we have 
for the Schwarzschild equation, uh, for the Schwarzschild space time, a very neat uh, super potential form, right? And for the spin half or Dirac field, we find that it's related to the metric function, uh, kappa, which is a parameterization of our angular momentum and the radial component. For the transverse traces form of the spin three on two fields, we find the same expression. However, when we get into the non-transverse traces form, things get a little more complicated. Should we go to more complex space times? Well, <laughs> it gets a bit worse. However, we did find something very interesting. When we subjected these fields to a large L limit, we found for the integer spin cases, a common form for both, uh, for all integer fields that we studied. I've plotted this here just to be a bit more explicit. Um, and that's quite neat, right? Because that means that we can apply the same kind of numerical tools to this very same form. What was even more interesting is that the same form held for half integer fields. That was unexpected. And you see that that works out for both the sitter and flat space times. Unfortunately, as we might expect, the ADS case veers from the norm and the potentials reduce to their own individual common form. And that's because we cannot discount the effect of this cosmological constant term uh, in this limit. Uh, and that has to do with the boundary conditions of the ADS space time, which to this day are still a matter of debate. Uh, in order to investigate how the quasi-normal frequencies behave in this large L limit, we applied the six order WKB approximation. Now, what we found was a feature that is similar and confirmed in the literature already, at least in the lower cases. Um, and that's that the frequency decreases for increased spin. And that held for both the integer and half integer cases. But one thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this uh, common 0 0.0962 form, right? Because that corresponds to the Lyapunov exponent, which has to do with the decay rate of a perturbation for the spherical symmetric uh, black hole. In particular, for the case that we're looking at here, that applies to the Schwarzschild black hole. So we have the fact that the real part continues to increase for increasing L and the imaginary um, reverts to a constant. And those features are summarized here. At present, we're applying this new method, well, relatively new, called the dolan Atterville expansion. So what we're doing there is we're looking at how this numerical technique fades with dealing uh, with the spin half fields and the spin three on two fields, uh, which is something that hasn't been done before in the literature to our knowledge. Now, I did mention the fact that we're also looking at the large n. So I'm going to do a quick overview of that because I see we're a little bit short of time. So the way this method works is that we, <clears throat> we plot the complex uh, roots of the metric function which is the origin and the black hole event horizon. We recast the potentials within these regions of uh, zero and infinity. And from these known solutions, uh, we plot the phase change along these two paths. Now this is a, a contour to infinity and this is a more tight contour around the singular pole. So we would expect those phase changes to be the same. Um, well, at least we expect them to be equivalent. And from that equivalence, we can extract this quasi-normal frequency. Uh, if we go into high dimensional cases, uh, we need only plot um, these poles once again. And we find that for 4D, 5D, 6D, and 7D, you can apply the same technique. Natari and Shiapa did just that. And they found that the quasi-normal frequency in this large n limit is the same 
irrespective of the type of gravitational mode uh, for DS, ADS, and black hole space times. For the Schwarzschild, they get this expression. And then for the rays in the Nordstrom, they get these. So what we find then is that, much like the large L case, there's a kind of uh, commonality um, irrespective of spin. In other words, it's almost as if the spin of the field is irrelevant. Although I put that in inverted commas because we see here that there is a J and that has to do with the spin of the field. So the spin comes into play during the calculation, but the overall uh, expression is common. And then two features that we noticed was that the potential for the Schwarzschild black hole near the origin remains the same in flat ADS and DS cases for the Schwarzschild and the raisin Nordstrom black hole. Similarly, the potential near infinity is once again a constant once you include the cosmological constant. At present, we're verifying our results for the application of the half integer spin in this monodromy technique. And that's all from me. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks to my supervisor, Prof Cornell, his students who are always there to support, and of course, Nitip for your generous sponsorship. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna, for, a, for an excellent and, uh, and very interesting uh, uh, talk. Well, uh, really well, uh, well done. Thank you. I see our participants are a little bit shy this afternoon. <laughs> And, uh, and nobody wants to risk to ask a question. A question. Uh, please, don't be shy. Um, we are, we are happy to give you 30 seconds to think about the questions. Let's, um, maybe we have to issue a prize for the first question. <laughs> we'll come up with one prize afterwards. So nobody wants to win anything, it seems. <laughs> but if you like, I'll leave my email in the chat and if anyone yes. wants to ask a question or talk, I'm available. Perfect. Thank you very much, yes. Anna. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank and you. if you would like to stop sharing your screen, we can. Ah, thank you very much. We can. Uh, um, so, sorry, on. there is a question. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry, Ilya, I didn't see it. Yeah, um, Ilya, then if, if you already <laughs> seen it, please, what is the question? Is there any evidence for higher dimensional black holes? Ah, okay. that's such a great question. Okay. So unfortunately, all the current testings have said no. Uh, however, there is an idea that, well, at least a theoretical idea that they still could exist, albeit that these extra dimensions could be uh, far too small for us to detect currently. So, you know, we'll keep an eye on the experimental results and hope eternally, but hopefully there are mathematical considerations and mathematical insights that we can gain from these explorations into higher dimensions. Okay, thank you very much.